Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sharon Goldstein, and I am the Director of Day School Programs at Gateways, and I want to welcome you all to our third of five webinars in our series, Our Daughters, Our Future, an educational series exploring girls' mental health and wellness. At Gateways, our mission is to provide high quality special education services, expertise and support to enable students with diverse learning needs to succeed in Jewish educational settings and participate meaningfully in Jewish life. Mental health can also be a barrier to academic success. And as we've all been seeing, mental health needs in teens and young adults has been on the rise and even more so as a result of the pandemic. At Gateways, we've been working to raise awareness and reduce the stigma around mental illness and give all of us the knowledge and tools and strategies to support our young people. We're so grateful to the Miriam Fund of Boston's Combined Jewish Philanthropies for sponsoring this important webinar series. Our agenda tonight is to hear first from Mallory, who will share her moving story. And then we're thrilled to bring back Dr. Ashley Warhol, who presented at one of our webinars last year and is back to go deeper into the topic of self-harm and suicide. Our format's gonna be a little bit different tonight. And so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Rachel Shine, who is gonna introduce the speakers and explain the format. I wanna remind everybody that you'll receive resources and a survey and, and the PowerPoint uh, following this event. And we really encourage you to complete the survey. It's helpful to have your feedback and to know about additional topics that you may want to hear about in the future. Rachel? All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so as, as Sharon mentioned, I am Dr. Rachel Schein, and I'm so thrilled to be coordinating this series. Um, we are going to hear from, um, as, as Sharon mentioned, first from Mallory and then from Dr. Ashley Warhol. Um, but before I introduce them, I just want to go over the format of today's webinar, given that we're going to be doing this a little bit differently than we have in the past. Um, and so this webinar is set up to be more of a discussion. Uh, so Dr. Warhol is going to um, present some information for you. Um, and then everybody will have the opportunity to ask um, both Mallory and Dr. Warhol questions. And so you can do that in a couple of different ways. Um, one of the ways is you can simply raise your hand, your Zoom hand, um, using the reactions feature, or, um, and I will call on you. Uh, the second option is to type your question uh, publicly in the chat, and I will read it off so everybody can see who's asking it. And then the third option is to type your question anonymously just to me in the chat. So it will only be known to me. So not completely anonymous, but mostly anonymous. I will not identify you when I ask the question. Um, and then I will read the question out loud and um, we'll go from there. And so there's many different ways uh, that you can do that. And I will remind folks again about how we're going to um, navigate that um, once uh, Dr. Warhol is done presenting. Um, so I am thrilled um, to introduce first Mallory Gotthelf. Mallory is um, a graduate of Northeastern University, local to uh, the Boston area. And she has um, created a, um, she's a, a speaker from This Is My Brave, and she has created a box service, which she can tell us more about, um, specifically for families uh, who have folks who are struggling with mental health uh, concerns or mental health challenges um, and ways to provide them different support. That's a really cool um, project. And then our speaker for the evening, um, is Dr. Ashley Warhol. Um, Dr. Warhol, Warhol sorry, is a psychologist uh, for the Department of Developmental Services uh, with expertise in um, suicide and self-injury, as well as dialectical behavior therapy, um, working with LGBT, LGBTQ individuals uh, and a variety of other areas. So, um, I am thrilled to first introduce Mallory to share her story with us. I got the 
Thank you so much for having me, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to speak with you all today, so we'll get started now. I'm sitting in my first therapist's office under the guise that I am a stressed out high schooler. I might have lied about the pretenses of being there, but I most definitely need to be sitting in this office. It's my sophomore year of high school, and while I should be worrying about tests, focused on college, and excited about sports, my social life, and future, none of that stuff seems to matter. I find myself grappling with a significant dip in my overall mood. I'm always unsettled, like this impending sense of doom might swallow me whole. I have this pit in my stomach leaving me feeling nauseous all the time. I regularly feel out of it, like I'm physically present, but mentally checked out. In a room full of people, I feel strangely alone. It's difficult to concentrate during the day, and more often than not, my mind feels fuzzy. I would look in the mirror and have trouble recognizing the face looking back at me. It was as if all the joy had drained from my face and a permanent frown and eyes that no longer sparkled were there in its place. I didn't enjoy a lot of the activities I did previously. Smiling and joking around with my friends felt pointless. In fact, I barely spoke. The joyful lilt in my voice, the one everyone from my childhood knew me by, faded until my voice barely existed at all. Every day felt like a drag. I couldn't wait to get home and get in bed so I no longer had to pretend I was okay for others. A facade I forced myself to wear so as to keep my pain a secret. It was an internal pain that someone couldn't see and therefore it almost didn't feel like it was even real or worth speaking about. I started engaging in self-harm when the pain didn't relent. Oftentimes people use self-harm because they feel like the pain they're inflicting is better than feeling nothing at all. Sometimes it's a way to regulate emotions. Sometimes, and in my case, self-harm was a way for me to make my internal intangible pain something I could see and point to to say, this hurts. It made the pain feel more valid to me when it was physical as opposed to emotional. And that's why I ended up sitting in that therapist's office. I knew I wasn't coping well and I thought someone might be able to help me. I hoped someone might be able to help me. She asked me many questions about myself, my family and what I was experiencing. And then she asked me if I self-harmed. Before I could even answer the question, she said, self-harm is attention-seeking behavior, so those who self-harm are simply looking for attention. She paused as if waiting for my response, but if I had any intention of being honest with her, that quickly vanished. You see, I had no idea how to tell people about the pain I was in or what I was going through. I wanted so badly to ask for help, but I didn't have the words or the courage to let people in. I so deeply feared that people would judge me, would find me weak, would think I was looking for attention, that I couldn't let them know what was going on. I never let them know the truth because I had my pride on the line and I had an image to maintain, an image that I was perfect. Society told me to never show emotions other than happiness. Hollywood showed me depictions of mental illness that were dramatized to capture an audience's attention but not capture their empathy for the real life struggles of a mental illness. And this therapist was telling me I was attention seeking. As much as I wanted to feel better and have her office be a place I could heal in, the shame, judgment, and humiliation I felt kept me silent. I left her office feeling like a failure. I wasn't sure how anyone was ever going to understand this pain I was going through. I posted some song lyrics to my social media later that evening that I thought best captured my current experience. I posted the words, don't know what I'm going through, but I keep on going through changes. Those words caught the eye of someone I went to high school with. Maddie was a year older than me and she reached out immediately. She told me she had been through a difficult time the year before and if I wanted to talk, she would listen. I remember thanking her for reaching out but denying that anything was going on. I feared her judgment too. 
but she was persistent. She reached out two more times. And when Maddie reached out that third time, I decided to talk to her because I wasn't finding any relief on my own. She was the only person I spoke to during that time. If anyone else asked me how I was doing, I lied. I became an exceptional liar. If people asked how I was feeling, I would look them straight in the eye, plaster a smile on my face and say, I was doing great. I didn't want them to see beneath the surface because they might not like me anymore if they knew what was really going on. After several months of only relying on Maddie and my less than helpful coping strategy of self-harm, I started having thoughts of suicide. It wasn't this one moment I can pinpoint and say, and that was the moment I wanted to end my life. It was months and frankly years of undealt with emotional pain and I just felt exhausted. It felt like I was climbing up a mountain with a bag of rocks on my back and I just didn't want to keep climbing anymore. I started thinking about suicide as a way to tell myself there was a way out. I didn't always have to hurt. I could make it stop. It's not that I wanted to die. I just couldn't figure out how to cope with the pain I was feeling. It was initially passive thoughts and then it started to become more serious thoughts. And then it turned into me writing a note to my family and friends apologizing to them. I still have that note to remind myself of how far I've come, but at the time I felt as though I had nothing else left to give. I thought people would be better off without me. I thought it would be better to make the pain stop than to have to keep going, knowing I felt the way I did. And that's when Maddie stepped in. She noticed the language in the text I would send her and thought I was hinting at suicide. Her fear of anything happening to me made her feel as though she could no longer keep this to herself. She came over on Christmas day during my sophomore year of high school to let me know I had two options. She would either sit in the basement with me as we called my parents down and told them what was going on, or I could send my parents down and wait upstairs while she told my parents what was going on. She said she would not leave until they knew. About an hour after Maddie spoke to my parents, they took me to the emergency room where I talked to hospital staff about the things I was dealing with. As I sat in the emergency room, my parents were making phone calls, canceling our plans with family friends for that evening. When I asked my mom what she said to everyone, she said, I told them the truth. I felt so many things at once as her words filled the small room I sat in. I felt relief wash over me as I realized my parents were not ashamed of me or what I was going through. That moment gave me permission to be and permission to heal. Later that day, I was admitted to my first psychiatric unit where I would begin my healing journey. My healing has looked like weekly therapy with a therapist who holds space for me to work through my emotions at my own pace and who challenges me to learn how to express my emotions in creative ways like drawing or collaging. I have focused on releasing the trauma stored in my body through medication and breath work. I have made my self-care a priority. Self-care is so many things. It's not just getting your nails done or taking a bath, though it certainly can be. Self-care is doing the things that make you feel well. For me, I hike I move my body through yoga or dance. I cook up delicious meals and I bake the best chocolate chip cookies hands down. I make time to spend with people who lift me up when I'm down and who make me laugh and feel joy. I make time to step away from screens and I try to pet as many dogs as I possibly can. Those are my things. Someone else may have completely different things. It's all about finding what works and incorporating it into your life, even if it's a busy life. But I think the best thing I ever found for my self-care is giving purpose to my pain. And that's not to romanticize mental illness. But for me, that was taking my experiences and sharing them with others to help them along their journey. A few years ago, I was working as an intern in the psychiatric hospital I was a patient in. I went to thank one of my group leaders for believing in me when I didn't believe in myself. Between tears of joy and hugs, she asked if I'd be willing to speak to the current patients. And I said yes, without hesitating for a moment. After speaking with these patients for 20 minutes, I left the hospital grinning ear to ear. I used to sit in that hospital and think my life wasn't going to amount to anything. I thought having a mental illness meant that the, that, that was the end of my potential. 
And there I was sharing my hope for not just my future, but for the future of the patients sitting in those same seats I had been in not too long before. It was pouring down rain as I left the hospital and I danced in it as I made my way to the car. My pain finally had meaning and I had a path in life that lit me up. While it had been, has been a long and at times difficult journey, my depression was not the end of the story. Self-harm and suicidal ideation were not the period at the end of the sentence. They were a semicolon in which the next chapter of my life would begin. I still find myself working through depressive episodes today, but I also run a business and I engage in writing and speaking around mental health. Depression still has its moments in my life, but in learning how to work through my challenges, lean into my support system and find ways to heal that work for my mind and my body, I still live a full and meaningful life. People with depression, people who have or still do struggle with self-harm or suicidal ideation, are exceptionally capable. We do great things with our lives. We're not lazy, we don't need to fix ourselves, and we're not doomed to lives without achievement and a sense of fulfillment. If we're given the tools and supports to properly manage our mental health, then we have infinite possibilities in this life, just like anyone who doesn't struggle with these things. Groups like these that openly address mental health challenges give me hope that mental health care is only going up from here. And that hope, well, that's what keeps me moving forward in the face of my depression. Thank you all so much for having me tonight. Thank you so, so much, Mallory. All right. Ashley. Mallory, thank you so much for sharing such a powerful story. Um, my gosh, it was, um, it just hit me to my core. And uh, in part, um, because uh, I am coming to you today as a professional um, and, uh, you know, a treater of these types of issues, um, but I'm also coming to you today as a, uh, a survivor of the very things that uh, Mallory talked about. And I genuinely cannot, um, say enough that Mallory, you captured everything um, about my story uh, in a way that I don't think I ever could have. So thank you so much for the gift that you gave a lot of people today in sharing um, your experience. And so, um, so before I kind of jump into my academic material, um, I wanted to share a little bit about my story and my process. Um, partly in part um, to really highlight what Mallory was talking about, about how people who uh, manage depression and suicidal ideation and self-harm um, in their history or presently can be very successful, um, high-functioning people who do really great things for those around them. And so um, that's partly why I chose to share my story with all of you today. Um, in addition, I think that um, the mental health field has a lot of stigma around mental health practitioners having lived experience, particularly around suicide and self-harm. Um, you know, while there are branches of treatment, um, namely addictions treatment, that really um, celebrate uh, people with lived experience, um, it's not so much the case when you're working with um, mental health disorders like uh, depression and self-harm and um, suicide. So um, I'm here hopefully to shatter the stigma. I think it's really important that practitioners are talking about their own experience with mental health challenges. Um, and um, here it goes, I guess. So very similar to Mallory, as a sophomore in high school, I um, started to experience um, significant depression. Um, and I had lived most of my life um, as the, um, the bright light in the room, the comedic, 
relief, um, always a smile on my face, always trying to make sure that the people around me were happy and felt cared for. Um, I was the mediator in my family as well as with my friends. Uh, and so I very much presented as a person who was happy, outgoing, um, just full of life. And yet inside, I felt like I was dying a little bit more each day. And um, as my sophomore year progressed, I started to withdraw from friends and family a little bit more. Um, and it got to a point where uh, I actually did not start with self-harm. Um, my journey started with um, two significant suicide attempts um, with a third intended, um, which I will get to. Um, but I really felt like there was no hope for me, that I was destined to be um, the person who hid their feelings, but always made the people around them feel as good as, as they possibly could. And so um, one night around uh, Christmas, um, when I was 15 years old, um, I attempted to um, hang myself, which was not uh, successful. Um, my parents were not aware of what had happened. Um, nobody was. I didn't tell my family, my friends, or anyone because um, much like Mallory so eloquently described, I didn't know what people were going to think about me or say about me, and I didn't want people um, having a negative perception of me. Uh, so then a couple of weeks later after that, um, uh, shortly after New Year's, um, I remember my mom thinking that something was off with me, but uh, she had plans that evening and I, I insisted that she go. Um, Don't worry about me, I'm fine. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna hang out. I totally had her convinced that I was okay, even though she had something in the pit of her stomach that was telling her like, no, something's not right. Um, so as soon as she left the house, um, I had, had a second suicide attempt uh, by overdose um, and uh, had actually called uh, my mom shortly after I had ingested um, a number of different medications, told her what had happened. Um, she came home and took me to the emergency room uh, for an evaluation and for medical treatment. Um, the following morning, I was assessed for an inpatient hospital stay. Um, and as, as it were, uh, the good actress that I was uh, completely convinced the mental health counselor that I was fine and didn't need inpatient hospitalization and that it was a mistake and I regretted it um, and that I was fine to go home. And so they released me that day. Uh, and I went home and I remember laying in my bed um, and did not get out for close to 15 hours. Um, just staring and thinking about how this next time needed to be the time that I didn't fail. Um, that following day, uh, my parents took me to my uh, pediatrician uh, for a follow-up appointment and something just was not sitting well uh, with the pediatrician um, and had contacted my parents about having me evaluated a second time. And I don't know what made her had a, have a nurse sit in the room with me, but I had already figured out the way that I was going to go. Um, and it involved uh, stealing some syringes and such from the doctor's office that I was in. And so um, she had a nurse sit with me. Um, she told my parents that I really needed to be evaluated. And, um, you know, shortly thereafter, I was admitted for um, an inpatient hospital stay where I really um, thought that I could start my healing process. Um, the problem is, is when I got to the hospital, I acted the exact same way that I did outside of the hospital in um, being the uh, comedic relief and making everyone around me laugh and feel good, even though I didn't feel good inside. Um, and then I actually um, started asking people, um, peers in the hospital, um, what they managed, what they did to manage their emotional pain. And that's where I learned about 
self-harm. And so it wasn't until that inpatient stay where um, it really dawned on me that there was a way that I could still manage my emotional pain without having to attempt suicide and end up in the hospital. Because the reality was, is I refused to go back to the hospital at all costs, but I still didn't have the coping skills that I needed to manage what was going on for me um, emotionally. And so I spent a couple of weeks in the inpatient hospital. Um, and when I was discharged, uh, that really started a year long journey of um, self harm for me and continuing to hide from people how I was truly feeling. That included my counselors, uh, my family, my friends. Um, there was only one person that I disclosed to after about nine months um, of self harm. And uh, that was my high school um, guidance counselor. Um, and she uh, eventually had a similar conversation as Mallory's friend, you know, either I'm calling your parents to tell them or you can have the conversation with me. Um, and so, you know, we did end up calling my parents together. Um, the problem is, is they were flabbergasted that this was even happening because I had no visible marks on my body. Um, I was self-harming in a spot that was, um, it was uh, my upper thighs where no one would ever really see. Um, and when I disclosed to my parents where I was self-harming, um, they said, well, you play sports, you wear shorts all the time, but I knew exactly um, how much space to leave between my self-harm um, area and my shorts, even when I squatted down. And so I was very, um, careful about what I was doing and where I was doing it. And again, I didn't want people to know that this is how I was coping because um, high schoolers can be cruel, you know? It's the messages of, oh, she's seeking attention um, or, you know, even worse, oh, she's crazy and we're not gonna be friends with her anymore. And so I was suffering in silence. Um, while engaging in self-harm for almost a year. And then um, I actually just had a moment where I, I woke up one day and said, this is not the life I wanna live anymore. Um, even though I was seeing a counselor, I, was, I had a good support system. I just said, this is not gonna get me to a place where um, I wanna be. I was missing out on activities with friends. I couldn't go to the beach because I had I couldn't wear a bathing suit without people asking questions. And, um, you know, I just, I wanted to live a life that was um, full of more meaning. And so it was at that point where I really turned a corner, um, really committed to the therapy that I was doing um, and started to make a change. Um, and while I also still struggle with um, depression from time to time, um, Self-harm is not something that I have uh, relapsed with. Um, I have uh, not engaged in self-harm in um, over 20 years, um, but it's always something that um, you never really completely quit, right? It's not like the thought doesn't cross my mind once in a while of that being a coping skill that used, uh, used to um, be helpful in the past. And so, um, but like Mallory, I, I you know, I hold uh, multiple jobs. I work with um, youth with this very issue. Um, I do not share my story with my clients because it's their time. Um, but I do feel that I have a perspective that um, helps in the treatment that I'm giving them um, because um, I, you know, fundamentally understand where the process um, has taken them and why they're in my office in front of me. And so um, I made a decision in college to devote my career to helping people um, with these areas of struggle because um, I didn't really have the support that I needed initially. Um, and I wanted to make sure that um, every person who struggled with this had the same chance at, at success and a fulfilling life as I did. So that's my story, not nearly as eloquent as Mallory, but I just have to say Mallory said all the things I couldn't. So again, I just, I have to thank you uh, through and through for that. So now that we've set the stage, um, 
I am going to give you all the like nitty gritty, right? So that's, that's my time. Um, that's my personal story and, and my time struggling with this topic. Um, but now I'm going to give you all the professional stuff and how to actually have the conversation with people. You do. People are saying your your story was very eloquently shared. <laughs> Listen, well. no, I, Mallory, <laughs> if you don't write a book, I got to write a book. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's get this slide show going. All right. Can everyone see the slides? I just want to make sure. All yeah, right. you're good. Great. All right. So you're all here, uh, not just to hear Mallory's story and my story, but you probably want to know how to actually have the conversation with teens. Um, little disclaimer, there are going to be some examples of self-injury that are shown. So I just like to give people a bit of a warning before we go into that. So just to give a little bit of background, so self-harm is different from suicidal behavior. And self-harm is um, sometimes called non-suicidal self-injury. And this is really any behavior that is deliberate, it's self-inflicted, and the intent is to damage your body in some way without the intent to die. So just because a person is engaging in self-harm does not necessarily mean that they're suicidal, it also doesn't mean that the self-harm was an attempt at taking their life. So some more common terms you may have heard about self-harm are self-injury, self-injurious behavior, self-harm, self-mutilation. And in the clinical treatment world, you often hear it called a parasuicidal behavior. So different types of self-harm might include cutting, burning, scratching. Some people engage in headbanging or punching themselves in the stomach or their head. Some people um, punch themselves in the thigh, somewhere in their leg. Um, carving is another one. Um, I, uh, I'm somebody who, in addition to cutting and scratching, also um, did some carving and typically the carving were words that were part of my uh, negative narrative. So things like um, fat or sad. Um, I used to carve um, the word bad um, into, in, you know, when I was engaging in that behavior. So um, it just kind of depends, but usually people are choosing words that are in line with their self-perception. Um, hair pulling is another one. Swallowing harmful objects. Um, restricted eating and purging are sometimes considered this, but you have to be very careful about what the intent is behind the disordered eating behavior. Um, because for some people, um, they are using restricted eating or purging as a weight management technique, um, but for others, they're using restricted eating and purging as a self-harm technique. So they wanna experience the pain that is felt through that um, disordered eating pattern. Um, one of the things that I often have to talk with people about in my clinical work is just the different degrees of intensity. So self-harm can be scary for anyone. Um, that being said, um, there are degrees of intensity that might cause me as a practitioner a little less concern um, than, you know, more of the severe or significant degrees. So the first degree is superficial. So superficial cutting or scratching is considered to be self-harm that's really on the surface and doesn't require medical attention. At times, the individual may you know, have red marks or start to bleed a little bit. Um, but whatever result of the superficial cutting or scratching is, it's typically minimal and can be treated with basic first aid. So some disinfectant wipes and band-aids. Um, you know, some don't require band-aids at all. Moderate is considered to be more than, whoops, sorry, considered to be more than superficial. 
um, but likely does not require medical attention. It's not on the surface. Um, usually we see a cut or a scratch that's a little bit deeper. Um, more first aid is usually required than um, what we would see in superficial, um, but it can still be managed at home. The third degree is severe or significant. So the bodily damage that's caused by the self-harm is enough to warrant medical attention. Um, maybe the person needs stitches or butterfly bandages. In some extreme cases, they require surgery. Um, and people who are engaging in severe or significant self-harm are considered to be at high risk, particularly for suicide. Now, if you remember a couple slides ago, I said just because a person is um, engaging in self-harm does not mean that they are suicidal. The reality is, is that a person who's engaging in severe or significant degrees of intensity of self-harm may unintentionally um, die by, by suicide, even though they are their intent was not to take their life. But the self-harm can be so severe that the consequences of that actually end a person's life. So um, it's important to consider these people with severe or significant self-harm at higher risk for death um, just because of the nature of their injuries. So there are a variety of reasons why people self-harm. So some people are using it as an expression or management of their emotion. Some people use it as physical relief or self-punishment. Um, other people make um, use self-harm to try to make something like emotions or thoughts more tangible. Um, we can't see emotions or thoughts in other people, but we can um, show hurt and pain um, by engaging in self-harm. And so um, even if I think back to my own story, um, for me, uh, I use self-harm really as a um, physical relief. It's not something that people knew about um, that I was doing. Um, when I was carving, at times it was for the purpose of self-punishment. But generally speaking, when I engaged in self-harm, I felt a incredible buildup of negative emotions whether that was depression or anxiety. And the way that I released that unmanageable feeling was to engage in cutting and scratching behavior as a way to just kind of um, have a physiological response. And I, I remember engaging in self-harm and just feeling an incredible sense of relief after where it was just like, oh, okay, now I'm okay. Um, and that's, you know, other people experience that, but there's a number of other reasons why people engage in that. And so self-harm is actually something that happens on a cycle. So usually what happens is that there is some sort of emotional suffering that a person is experiencing. At some point in that suffering, it becomes too much to handle and the person becomes emotionally overloaded and starts to panic about what am I supposed to do with all these emotions that I'm having? That panic in turn leads to the self-harming behavior as a way to relieve, you know, whatever they're experiencing. And the person experiences a temporary relief, but usually what follows after that temporary relief is feelings of guilt and shame, maybe some fear around, oh my gosh, what are people gonna think? And then it just feeds into the cycle of emotional suffering and we see the cycle start all over again. So some behavioral cues that you would wanna look for um, to figure out if someone is self-harming. Um, if it's the summer or a hot day, like the weather is starting to get nicer now, if people are, you know, if you've got kids in your life that are wearing long sleeves or pants well into July, um, that would be a red flag of saying like, oh, are they trying to hide something on their body? Um, if they're spending long periods of time in the bathroom when it's not typical behavior, it's possible that they're engaging in self-harm. Now you don't wanna jump to conclusions, but you know, again, might be something that you wanna look further into. Um, if you are emptying the trash can at home and you come across 
bloody tissues or band-aids in the trash can that really have no other explanation. Um, spots of blood on clothing that the that you know the person can't really explain or tries to explain away time and time again. Sudden or more significant withdrawal or isolation from other people. An increase in noticeable bruising on parts of the body might be an indicator that they are um, punching themselves. Finding little pieces of um, broken glass or hard plastic or things like, you know, if you're ever like cleaning up in a person's room or, you know, around their desk at school and you're just like, gee, why do they have all these little pieces of like broken mirror or something? Why don't they just throw it out? That might be a red flag. Um, and then any sort of changes in eating patterns could also be um, something you want to look further into. So if you're a parent, there are some things that you can do. Um, it is okay to ask your child directly about self-harm. I know it's a hard question to ask. Um, one of the things um, parents always ask me about self-harm and suicide is, what if I ask the question and I put the idea in their head? And the reality is that the idea was already in their head. You're not going to put something in their mind that they're just suddenly going to try if they haven't thought about it already. So it's important that you're asking the question because you're opening the door and letting them know that, hey, I'm a safe space to have this conversation with. Always start by highlighting that your child is not in trouble and that you're not angry with them. The safer they feel and the less judgment they feel, the better the conversation is going to go. As a parent, you can say something like, I've noticed you seem down lately and sometimes teenagers self-harm to cope. Is that something that you've thought about doing or have already done? Um, you can also ask, I've noticed you're wearing long sleeves. It's pretty hot out. Is there something you're trying to hide? Because whatever it is, I'm here to listen and help. With suicide, ask your child directly about their intent to end their life. It's okay to ask, have you ever thought about killing yourself? Do you have a plan? Are you going to follow through with that plan? And if they are saying, yeah, I've thought about killing myself, and they've, they've said, you know, I've been eyeing up those pills in the bathroom medicine cabinet, make sure that they don't have access to the means to follow through and that they're getting the proper help that they need afterwards. You may need to, for a period of time, secure the environment. So if there is a um, mechanism of choice for self-harm, maybe you're locking those away or you know, making sure that your child doesn't have access to them, at least for a period of time. Um, making sure you're listening actively and non-judgmentally is really important. Um, let your child know that they're not alone. You're there to support them and that you want to get them help. And again, that they're not in trouble. Um, you'll likely want to ask to see the self-harm to assess for severity. Make sure that there aren't any infections um, or anything of that nature. And, you know, if you may need to go seek medical attention if they're severe. And the last piece is that please remember that relapse is a part of recovery. It is okay if your child has gone three months without self-harming and engage in the behavior one time. It's okay. They can still get back in the saddle and make progress. And if your child relapses, the last thing you want to do is apply judgment or guilt or shame to them because it's it's actually going to um, cause the treatment to to backslide. Just you know, validate that their emotions are must have been really high for them to do that, and then get a plan in place for them to cope ahead for next time. So things you you don't want to do. This is I would not do this as a parent if you're going to like open a dialogue with your child. Um, do your best not to panic, although um, I know it's easier said than done, but the reality is that the more anxious you become, the less likely your child is to talk. So if your child says, yes, I've been self-harming, here, let me show you, and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, what do you mean you're doing that? Ah, like, they're going to just shut right down, okay? 
And so whatever kind of internal coping mechanisms you have to just take a deep breath and like it's put on your poker face, you know, just like act like it's not a big deal and say, okay, um, all right, like let's figure out what we need to do next. Um, do your best also not to catastrophize or assume the worst. Again, if they're self-harming, don't automatically assume that they're, you know, an, intending to end their life. That's a different part of the conversation. Um, please don't punish your child for engaging in self-harm. They're already punishing themselves by self-harming. And so, um, you know, clients I've worked with have said, you know, the worst thing my parent has done to me is grounded me for self-harming. Like if I, if I had another way to manage my emotions, I would. Um, so now they're taking away my access to some of my other coping skills, like friends or social media or whatever consequence they're issuing. Um, but they, they already feel bad enough. So they don't need further punishment. Um, don't take it personally or make it about you. Um, I've been in family therapy situations where parents have said, how could you do this to me? Um, and that is not helpful for the child to hear, especially someone who is already taking on a lot of responsibility for other people's emotions. Um, as Mallory mentioned from her experience, don't say things like you're just looking for attention. That's not, um, that's going to shut down the conversation um, really quickly. Uh, and then the last piece is just remember that it's not your information to disclose to anyone other than professionals working with your child. Um, if your child wants your best friend or the aunt or the uncle to know about their self-harm, um, leave that up to them to say, yeah, it's okay if you let them know. But, um, you know, divulging that information against their, um, against their consent really um, can also rupture any sort of trusting relationship that you've built. So if you're an educator, there are also some things you can do. So if a student approaches you and discloses, listen attentively and without judgment. Thank them for sharing this really difficult information and let them know that you wanna help them. And to do that, they, that you need to contact their guidance counselor. You can offer to go with them to guidance if it would make them feel more comfortable. Um, or you can say, I'll, I'll tell them first and then have them follow up with you. Um, even if the student asks you not to share, let them know that if they're hurting themselves or another person, that's what we call a limit to confidentiality. And that they have to, uh, they have to notify the appropriate people to make sure that um, that that child is safe or others are safe. It's also important to remind students that you're not able to keep secrets. As professionals, whether you're a therapist or a teacher, there are no secrets. Um, they are, you know, and while secrets um, may feel like the way to a trusting relationship, um, kids are actually gonna appreciate more that you're keeping their um, well-being at the forefront um, by, roping in additional people to the support system. Things not to do, don't panic. That's a pretty universal theme. Just do your best to keep that poker face on. Um, remember you're a mandated reporter. So if you're working with children, you have to report to somebody that they're hurting themselves. So don't promise to keep information a secret. Even if that child is gonna say, if you tell someone I'm never talking to you again, I've said things like, well, I'd rather you be mad at me than dead. And so I'm going to tell somebody who needs to know this. Um, and even though you're a trusted adult, don't feel like you have to take on the role of a professional counselor. That is left up to other people who have um, the training and the comfort to have these conversations. So the best thing you can do is help the student get the resources that they need. All right, so that opens us up for questions that you might have. And uh, Rachel did let everyone know the mechanisms by which you can ask those questions. So um, feel free to ask them directly of Mallory or myself or both of us. Um, and I'll open up the floor.
You can also put them in the chat if you don't want to ask them directly. Um, so um, we do have a couple, okay, there we go. We have a couple of questions in um, the chat. So the first question is um, for both of you, um, or is there anything that you would add to the recommendations that you wish teachers may have done or may have asked you? Um, my experience was that um, nobody really asked anything. Like I was sleeping through class. I was an A student who was suddenly getting C's. Um, I was always a bit of a class clown, but I was getting into a little bit more trouble than usual, extra detentions, some suspensions, which was, that was out of character for me. But instead of asking like, what's happening for you right now, Ashley, it was, here's the punishment, go see the principal, go, here's your detention. Like nobody actually asked what was going on for me they they translated it and perceived my behavior in a way that was opposite of what was really happening so i would say as a teacher never assume that a child is being bad or problematic um, for the sake of making your life a nightmare there is potentially something more significant going on and take a minute to um have the compassion and the empathy to, to ask the questions. Yeah, that's a really great point. And for, for my situation, I was pulled out of school for such a period of time or in home and hospital programs while I was in uh, outpatient treatment because it was hard to work around school. That teachers started, they eventually needed to be aware of the situation of why I actually wasn't in the classroom anymore. And when I did return to school, it, they made they tried to make accommodations in space that I think was really helpful and that I would recommend if it's possible small things like sometimes I didn't want to eat in the cafeteria because it was overwhelming for my anxiety to be around all of those people and sometimes people had a lot of questions about where I'd been and so a teacher would let me maybe do some work or sit in their classroom to take some quiet time or some space if that's a reasonable accommodation. And that made me feel a lot safer being in school and less likely to call my mom and say, I need to be picked up, I need to get out of here. And the other thing was sometimes doing homework assignments became really, really challenging for me. And so sometimes it was just checking in with my teachers and saying like, look, I wanna get this assignment done realistically, like this is what's been going on. Is there any way I can get an extension? And having that dialogue with my teacher or them asking me before I could even say like, this is gonna be two weeks late and I know I'm not gonna get it done. And having that open conversation made it a lot easier for me to feel like I wasn't gonna fail out of school, which was a really big fear of mine being someone who was such a perfectionist. So I think having that open dialogue and making accommodations where it feels appropriate is really, really helpful. Thanks Mallory and Ashley. Um, Another person asked, um, were antidepressants an option um, at the beginning of treatment um, and did meds play a role? How did meds play a role in your treatment? Either one. Um, well, I certainly, uh, antidepressants were actually a, a, played a big role, at least in the, initially in my recovery. Uh, my first hospitalization, they offered to put me on medication and I was really, really hesitant. I was very scared of medication, what that meant for me, the stigma around it. I didn't particularly like jazz music and that seemed to be the happiness peak on all of the commercials for antidepressants. So I was really hesitant to take the medication but I had a really kind nurse practitioner kind of explain what the medication would do for me, which was essentially bring me back to baseline and give me an even footing as my peers without depression so I could participate in therapy and use the coping strategies that I was learning. I will say that over the course of the first, I'd say six years of my treatment, I uh, had tried 16 different medications, different combinations, 
And at some point the side effects were outweighing the benefits. I was having a lot of physical reactions and it came time where my psychiatrist and I decided that it would be time to take a break from medication. So I'm currently not using it as a part of my treatment. It's never off the table for me, but I did make kind of a kind of an agreement with my parents and my psychiatrist that I would only use medication as a part of my healing if it was in fact outweighing the side effects or negative things that potentially could happen with my body. And so once that became the case, I did taper off of them and have since not been using them. But I certainly, if it works for people, it is something to not be stigmatized. It is something that is really, really important and powerful for people in their recovery, again, if it works for them. Yeah, and I don't think I was on medication until after my inpatient um, hospitalization, even though I was in therapy and really experiencing significant depression, but I was very resistant to medication for many of the reasons that um, Mallory highlighted. Um, after my inpatient hospitalization, I did start on an antidepressant that um, I actually had a really negative um, reaction to that um, sent me on a series of other medications that I didn't necessarily need, but they were treating a reaction instead of an actual symptom. So, um, you know, after, you know, a few months, they were able to really dial in the, the correct medication and it, it worked for um, the period of time I needed it um, and then um, came off of it for a very long time. Um, but it is something that, you know, I'm, I'm back on antidepressants. I have been for the last, uh, year or so, but prior to that, I was taking anti-anxiety medication. I think the challenge is that anxiety and depression are like in this holy matrimony. And so like, you don't even know, is it anxiety? Is it depression? Is it both? Like what's feeding which, and, you know, sometimes you have to play around, like sometimes it's anxiety that's feeding depression or vice versa. But, um, I know for me, I only use medication when I feel like I've exhausted the other tools I have in my toolbox and never intend to be on them forever. And so even though I've been on medication for the last year or so, um, through other modes of treatment, like, you know, weekly therapy and that sort of thing. Um, the goal is always to get off of that and be able to kind of manage um, in other ways. But I'm similar to Mallory, like, I think if medication is an option and it works for people, um, it's just another tool to try to get you stabilized to learn the skills that, that are going to help you long term. What would you say as a provider, right, or somebody who's working with parents who their child is resistant to taking medication or vice versa, right, the child wants medication and the parent is resistant to the medication. Um, how do you kind of navigate that, that dynamic? Mm -hmm. I mean, I always start with, um, education. You know, sometimes what happens is somebody's resistant to medication because they don't fully understand the purpose or they um, have latched on to myths about medication use um, or even stigmas about it um, and misinformation. So what I try to do, whether I'm working with a child or parents, is to try to correct any misunderstandings that exist out there about medication and to provide some, you know, data-driven, evidence-based um, support for why medication works um, in some cases. I mean, and the reality is, though, is that medication is not always something that people want to pursue. And um, I am in support of kids and families who want to try other avenues for a period of time without medication. Um, but if, you know, they've been trying things for, you know, six months and, you know, therapy and skills training and all that stuff isn't really putting a dent in the symptoms and the behaviors, then it's like, all right, why, I mean, we've tried everything else. Why don't we just give this a shot and see if it at least boosts the mood of the person um, I'm treating um, to, to access the skills that we're trying to teach them. So I'm going to, there's a couple of questions in the chat. I'm going to ask the last one first and then go back. 
Um, what modes of treatment um, should be utilized prior to medication? So what are the other avenues that, that you were kind of referring to there? So my caveat would be is that the best outcomes do occur with therapy and medication as a combination. Um, but, you know, again, I know that some people aren't um, really keen on medication for whatever reason. So um, dialectical behavior therapy is the treatment modality of choice for individuals with emotion dysregulation disorders. That could be people who self-harm or who engage in suicidal behavior. It could be for people with depression or anxiety or substance use disorders. Um, it was a treatment that was originally um, created for um, women with borderline personality disorder, but it has since become a really helpful um, treatment modality for any disorder that has emotion dysregulation underlying it. And so um, DBT is, it's kind of hot in the treatment world now, which is good. It used to have a stigma because it was like, oh, DBT is for people with borderline personality disorder, and it's not. Um, and in reality, we all use DBT skills every day. We just don't know that they're called DBT skills. Like, I'm sure you weigh your pros and cons every day around, do I have the slice of pizza or the salad for dinner? You know, <laughs> like we're, we're always making decisions by weighing you know, the benefits and the costs. And that's a DBT skill is pros and cons. And so a lot of what you do intuitively is built into this treatment intervention with a combination of behavior chaining, which really helps people understand the why behind their behavior. So what is triggering the self-harm or the suicidal behavior? What thoughts, feelings, and emotions are driving that? And then also what's happening after, because self-harm and suicidal behavior are reinforced by something. It might be internal, it might be external, but until you get on top of why that behavior continues, um, it's hard to get it to stop. And so that's what DBT um, really focuses on is getting an understanding of the why behind the behavior and then teaching the skills to um, interrupt that chain of behaviors. Thank you. Um, so um, Amy asked, after I start the conversation about how they're doing, how do I know if they want me to follow up or stay out of it? It's a really great question. I, I will speak from my experience with, with my parents because I was self-harming and they were aware of it, we kind of set up almost like a we would we negotiated and we compromised on a situation. I didn't particularly like to talk about it, but I knew in order for them to, to trust me, one of the things that Ashley mentioned was, you know, removing things from the environment to make it a safer environment. And they would remove my razor blade from the shower because they were concerned and I would have to ask them to use it. Um, in the shower. And so one of our compromises for them to build that trust back up was that we need to at least follow up on things. So we would schedule actually a day and a time where we would follow up. And if I, and I would sit there with them and we'd have the conversation, we'd have the dialogue on an agreed upon time and a place where we both felt like we could enter the space and have this open conversation. I think it's good to keep the dialogue open. Maybe, maybe your child doesn't want to talk about it, you know, but say, how about we just revisit this in, in one week and we'll just sit down and check it and not put a lot of pressure on it and say, we have to delve into all of this stuff and have this really long dialogue just as a check-in to put it there. So you both kind of have that stability and that place where you're meeting in a safe spot and can have the open and honest conversation. And if, again, if it's not a long conversation, that's fine too, but at least setting up that check-in, I actually think even as someone who didn't really wanna talk about it, that was a really great space for me because I knew I had somewhere to go if something really was coming up and I wasn't afraid to broach the subject because it was our sacred time to talk about it without distractions or without anything else getting in the way. Um, just a follow-up question um, is, what about as an educator versus a parent? So how 
um, how do teachers know whether or not to continue to continue the conversation and, and whether or not they're interfering too much? I mean, I think there is a delicate balance between checking in too much and not checking in enough. And so for, you know, the best advice I can give is to, you know, after a student discloses to you, um, you know, a couple days afterwards, just very kind of generally check in. Hey, I'm just checking in to see how you're doing. I know you shared some really tough stuff with me. Um, and I just want you to know that I am here to talk or listen if you want, or to pretend like it didn't happen. Like I'm going to take your lead um, and, and just want you to know that every now and then I'm going to revisit this, um, you know, and just remind you every now and then, but please know that this is an open door that any time you need to, you can come to me to continue the conversation. And a lot of times that's enough to put the ball in their court and then invite it in between. And then I usually encourage teachers to just, you know, once a week or so, like just generally, hey, everything okay? You know, how, how are things going? And just checking in briefly, you know, oh, how are sports going? Oh, did you watch any cool Netflix shows lately? Like just even starting a dialogue of like chit chat can open the door there. But yeah, I, I can appreciate not wanting to like every period be like, are you okay? Do you need anything? Like, cause that's just, you know, that's kids, teenagers are not gonna be about that either, so. Yeah, it's truly a balance. Um, Ashley, this question I think uh, hits on your certainly um, area of expertise. So a question about, um, other things to consider with LGBTQ and trans youth, uh, which I understand have higher rates of teen suicide. Um, this person shared that they have lost um, two trans women in their congregation to suicide two years ago. And so um, really how to kind of focus on that um, and pay uh, attention to it and what questions specifically to ask for that population. Yeah, uh, and I'm whoever, I'm so sorry that that, that um, is a loss that you've experienced. And um, yes, you're 100% right. The suicide rates of LGBTQ individuals are upwards of, well, particularly trans individuals are four, sorry, they are 10 times the national average, right? So we're looking at 40% uh, suicide rate for gender diverse individuals. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's hard to know what kind of supports a trans person has in their life. Um, but what I would encourage you to do is to look for the same signs you might look for in another person in your congregation or your, your life around, um, you know, this person doesn't seem okay. Like, are they quieter than usual? Are they a little bit more withdrawn? Um, you know, just being that person to, to approach someone and say, hey, I just, I just noticed like, you know, you seem a little bit off lately. And I don't know if it's COVID or the weather, you know, who, you know, just be like nonchalant about it. But open the door and say, I just want to check in with you and see if things are going okay. Um, and that, you know, that can invite a conversation. Um, maybe they'll tell you, you know, they're really struggling with um, family acceptance or they don't have any supports. And so if, um, if those are the cases, then it's, you know, really finding um, community-based programs or services that can really be that support and provide them with the resources that they need in order to get in um, gender-affirming therapy, um, support groups, um, there are drop-in centers, like there are a lot of resources, especially in um, the Boston area and even out here in Worcester where I live. So, um, but it's, it's amazing what you'll find out from a person by just asking like, hey, is everything okay? And I think that's that can be the most difficult first step because you 
you're like, oh, this person's going to think like, well, who are you? But even if they don't know you and they've never met you, they're going to feel seen. And that goes for anybody. They feel seen. And so that can be really powerful when a person feels like there is no hope left. Absolutely. Um, so there was also um, a question that came through specific to um, when a teen um, either discloses that they're engaging in self-injury or, um, or is found engaging in self-injury and they're in a summer program. So I'm gonna answer the question for you um, because this is something that I spent a lot of time working with during the summer. Um, it's all about how it's handled, right? And so there is unfortunately a, um, a much lower threshold in, in summer programs, whether it's um, Israel programs or camps, than there is in um, kind of secular pro or not secular programs, but more mainstream programs that have supports. And the reason that there's a lower threshold is because particularly when kids are away from home, the parent, the, the guardian is not there um, and the impact that it has on other kids can be really significant. And so the most important thing is that when oftentimes we do have to send kids home if they are in, actively engaging in self-injury in the middle of a camp program because there's not mental health professionals there to provide them with support. Um, and so there's, it provides, it has a really high level of risk. However, it's really important that there's no shame, that it's all about, um, you know, Johnny was or was having a, a tough time and he is going home or she is going home to get some extra support so that they can come back next summer or rejoin your group in a stronger place. And we embrace them in this community and we celebrate them in this community, but they, and we can't necessarily provide the support that they need. So it often becomes uh, while parents, or while we would love to be able to maintain everyone in a summer program, um, when they're engaging in self-injury, it becomes too high of a risk factor and has a detrimental impact um, on lots of folks, including the individual who's not able to get the support. I hope that answered the question. I know it's not the most popular answer, but unfortunately, that's usually the because unless it's a, a program that has a, a lot of mental health support and is a treatment facility, right? Like that's a different, and there are overnight camps that also provide treatment, so. Um, other folks, other questions, Michelle, I um, just, so Michelle shared that it's so complicated to decipher whether a teen's moodiness, irritability are normal and hormonal or more of a concern. So Mallory or Ashley, I don't know how you might, I, I absolutely, um, but I don't know your thoughts on, what your thoughts are on that. I certainly have had this conversation with my own mom um, because prior to them bringing me to treatment and becoming aware of my situation through, through the friend who told them, my mom had her, her thoughts that something was going on. And at the beginning, when it first started happening, that withdrawal, she initially did think it was just like I was being more irritable or more, you know, my hormones were changing. And she thought, okay, that could be a possibility. But I think she kept kind of monitoring the situation and more things started to happen that didn't seem typically hormonal or irritable. It was, it was becoming more intense, the withdrawal. And she was starting to notice other signs that I think I was trying to hide from her, stuff like the self-harm. I remember that she asked me one time, like, you know, like, what's that on your arm? And I tried to, you know, lie my way out of it and say, oh, I just had a rash, I was scratching at it, whatever. I don't, she never bought that, but she wasn't sure where to go from there. And so I think, I think there's a point where it starts to cross over into something more serious because it's more intense and there's other symptoms that don't really correspond with that hormonal change. So it's just something you do really have to monitor. And if you, 
if you really are, you know, concerned, you can, you can just ask. And I think that was the thing that we were really struggling with was just having that first conversation of, is this what's happening with you? And potentially it's just because we didn't have the language for it. And I, my mom told me she wished she would have had a group like this where she could have asked all of these questions. But I think she, she said, if I had just asked, maybe we could have had a better understanding. And so I do think that's a good place to start. Yeah, and I even think about my own experience where like, you know, as an adolescent, you're kind of trying to shut your parents out to begin with and find yourself. So like there was a clear shift for me where it was like, I have my bedroom door shut because I'm talking to my friends on the phone and I don't want to be bothered to, I have my bedroom door shut. I'm not coming out for hours. There are no sounds coming from behind the door or some like really emo music about like, you know, just sad, sappy music, which is, you know, <laughs> not what I typically listen to. So like there were some environmental cues that really, you know, similar to what Mallory's saying, like it, it really was a clear shift between like what a typical adolescent would be doing um, and what they're not. And so um, even if they're withdrawing a lot, it doesn't mean they're self-harming, but it's worth asking the question of like, hey, you've just really been behind closed doors a lot more lately. Like, are you feeling okay? Is anything bothering you? Like, even if it's not self-harm, you're at least opening the door to talk about depression or anxiety or, you know, some situational factors that might be impacting their mood. Um, but yes, like I agree, it's, it's hard to know sometimes, um, but just asking the question becomes really the most important because um, we never want to assume anything, but we, we can only assume unless we go straight to the source. Um, another a question um, is how, what did you want your peers to know? And how did, how would you suggest that someone, you know, talk to peers about their friends who are self-injuring? I wanted my friends to know that um, it didn't change who I was as a person at my core and that um, it didn't mean that I was crazy, you know, like, and that I think for a lot of adolescents being viewed as crazy is like the last thing people want. And so I just, I, I wish, um, I wish my peers just like, it's a little bit like the scarlet letter, I think. Right. And it's just like, you know, this thing that I'm struggling with, um, is just a part of me and that they won't be stigmatized or judged if they support me, which I think was also a concern. Like they didn't want to be associated with the girl who was hospitalized and is self-harming because then it's like, you're crazy by association. And I'm using these derogative terms um, purposely because th those are the things that were said to me and are still said now in, in you know, the work that I do. Adolescents are having these conversations all the time. Oh, I'm not hanging out with her because she's crazy. She self-harms. And it's, that's not what it's about, but that's the perception. And I just wish that, um, I wish my peers and peers nowadays could really understand the power of supporting someone versus um, not becoming a, a target of, of bullying or, or ridicule. Yeah, I would have to second that. There is, you don't want to be judged in high school. High school is a hard enough time as it is. You want to feel like you fit in with your peers. And there's this other thing that you're struggling with that you're like, oh, this is going to separate me from my peers even further. But I think the best I have one friend in particular who I can very clearly comes to mind who I was with her one night and a bunch of other people and I was really overwhelmed. I had self-harmed and I had called my mom and I was like, you have to come pick me up. And she walked me to the door and she said, no matter what's going on, like, I'm here for you. I don't really care what it is. You don't need to tell me about it, but I, I'm here. And what, what if you want to talk, I'm here. And that stuck with me 
I mean, to this day, I think about it all the time. I text her randomly and I'm like, thanks for always being there when other people couldn't. And so it was just as simple as that, as letting me know that I still had a person who would who would just treat me as I was, which was just another human being. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't just the girl with the mental illness. I was just a girl who was trying to live in this, in this world. And she treated me just like that. And that was the most affirming thing she could do in making me feel seen. Thank you. And another question um, is, what um, would you suggest saying to the sibling? How, how, as a parent or a teacher, do you address self-injury or mental illness in a sibling with the, particularly the younger sibling, but I think it goes both ways. I think so professionally when I've done work with families around this, it's um, explaining what's happening to the sibling in an age appropriate way without disclosing too much detail that would make a child feel uncomfortable. So I, I can recall one case in particular um, who had a, um, she was a 16 year old female and had a younger brother who was like eight, something like not even double digits yet. And um, we really worked together in family therapy to explain to the younger sibling that, you know, everyone has emotions and everyone has problems come up at different times in their lives. And just like people, all people look different, people handle their problems in different ways and people feel their emotions in different ways. And sometimes, um, people need extra help um, in managing their emotions in safe ways. And sometimes they don't, but you know, your older sibling, in this case, it was his sister. Um, your sister is just one of those people who feels things differently from, uh, you know, compared to other people and needs a little bit of extra support in figuring out how to express that in a safe way. And that was enough for that sibling to, to understand that you know, his sister needed extra support and that's why they were um, kind of in family therapy and that his sister was going to, you know, different programs and such. But um, that's really the best advice I can give is to just don't hide it, don't talk around it, but don't disclose so much that it's not age appropriate and, and use language that a child is gonna understand. Um, another question, uh, I have one child who hides his cutting and another who shows me their self-harm after most incidents. Have you seen both patterns and would you speak differently to each person or to each? Yes, uh, so um, I have seen both. Um, generally as a practitioner at that point, we're looking at really what's maintaining the self-harm behavior. So. Um, with clients that have a tendency to show people right after they self-harm, um, we really look at, um, you know, how other people are responding to that. And then are there ways that need to be changed that will encourage a different expression of emotion that is still getting that need met? So I want to be careful because sometimes people translate self-harm and then immediately showing as, oh, they're just trying to get attention. And that's not, that that is fundamentally not what they're trying to do. They just don't know how to ask for help in any different way. And so by self-harming and then immediately showing a person, it often pulls for things like compassion and caring and, oh my gosh, are you okay? Um, let me take care of that for you. What do you need? And so we would teach clients who use that as an expression of um, needing help, different ways to access the same support without having to engage in self-harm. Um, whereas somebody who is self-harming and not disclosing or showing their um, self-injury, um, we're likely looking at a different maintenance of the behavior. So, you know, targeting it. Um, is a little bit different around like, all right, what is the function of self-harm for you? Is it relief? Is it, you know, um, punishment? And so then we would target 
that maintenance through a series of different, you know, therapeutic interventions like skill building, maybe some, um, you know, changing negative cognitions and that sort of thing. So yes, the, that was a long answer to just say that yes, um, in treatment, we would look at that in different ways. And then one other question, if you know this off the top of your head, so how common is it for males to self-harm? It's common, but I don't know the exact statistic that actually. Yeah, I, I don't know the exact statistic, but I think um, self-harm can look different in males. So um, self-harm has a tendency to take more of a physical aspect to it. So I've, I've um, worked with adolescent males who used to provoke fights as a way of engaging in self-harm. So he would verbally provoke people so that he would get punched. And then like, that was his form of self-harm. That was, that was his intent. And so um, we might see things like punching themselves in the head or pulling their hair or, you know, that sort of thing um, versus the traditional cutting and scratching. But, it, but males do also cut and scratch. It just really kind of depends on um, what the person has found to be most effective um, for them. So I know that we are right at the end of time. Um, there is, um, I have posted the link to the survey or the feedback survey in the chat and you'll also get it via email, but if you could please uh, fill it out, we really um, value your feedback. Um, and thank you so, so much to Mallory and Ashley for sharing um, your stories and with us and the information that you provided today. It was um, really wonderful and shows in the comments as well.